Hello and uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm Art Danielov, uh, CEO of Flatgrid. And today we'll talk about uh, maximizing Oracle database uptime on AWS. Um, my co-presenter today is um, Bennett Borovkam, uh, Partner Solutions Architect you know, from AWS. Yep, hey, hey Art, hey everybody. And also in the background, uh, Emil Sildes, uh, my colleague, will be taking questions uh, that you can ask. Uh, you can ask at any time uh, during this webinar. Uh, there is a Q and A feature uh, you can find in in the Zoom, uh, and we will answer your questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. And we'll have uh, we'll probably use uh, 45 minutes for the uh, presentation and. Uh, I will have uh, some 15 minutes reserved for uh, questions. So let me start with uh, a quick overview of um, uh, what Slackgrid does. So Slackgrid is, um, uh, is a company, uh, as a software vendor, focused on um, uh, Oracle database uh, infrastructure and more specifically on uh, high availability. And uh, we've been working with AWS for, for quite a long time already. Uh, Bennett, do you want to uh, add a little bit about how we've been working together? Yeah, thanks, Art. Yeah, so my name is Bennett Barofka. I'm a partner solutions architect with AWS. So I work with software vendors like FlashGrid to help them build and market solutions for joint customers of AWS and, and, and FlashGrids. So, um, today we're going to talk specifically around FlashGrid's products and how they work with AWS. But to talk a little bit about the partnership between FlashGrid and AWS, it's really grown over the last few years. And a lot of customers, you know, that start bringing their Oracle workloads to the AWS cloud do start off sometimes with our Amazon RDS service, which is our fully managed service. But some customers need some very uh, extensive requirements met and have some mission critical workloads or need some really you know, guided consultation in, in migration and deployment of these complex Oracle workloads on AWS. And so FlashGrid has a number of services and solutions available to these customers that have these really unique situations and scenarios that they need to help with on their journey. And so through this partnership, FlashGrid's really leaned into some of the programs we have available um, for our software partners. So uh, they've become a public sector partner and a government ISV competency partner which means that FlashGrid has a proven track record of working with governments, nonprofits, higher education uh, to help them on their Oracle database solutions and their migration journeys. FlashGrid's products are also AWS Outpost service ready, service ready designated, which means that their products have been tested and certified to run on our AWS Outpost service, which is our fully managed hardware service that can be deployed in customer locations uh, for low latency or data residency requirements. And FlashGrid's, um, of course, a software vendor, but also an advanced tier services partner. And they've got, uh, through our certification program, to be able to help uh, hands-on consultative support for customers that need migration assistance or to accelerate their time to value for deployment of Oracle workloads on the AWS cloud. And being part of our partner programs, FlashGrid goes through a rigorous technical review process. And so we we put our software vendors through this rigor, through this technical reviews to make sure they meet the best practices and standards we want for everybody in our network. And I invite people to go to our website and look up FlashGrid on our partner network and look at some of the joint customer references and case studies we have available. And so we do have some stories out there that can help uh, customers in other situations or similar situations understand how FlashGrid works in their uh, Oracle database migration journey to the AWS cloud. And finally, uh, I do want to highlight that FlashGrid is available on our AWS Marketplace. And uh, if anyone hasn't looked at our Marketplace, it's a, it's, a mar it's a platform for customers to go browse and buy software and services from various vendors. And, and so this makes it very easy from a licensing and procurement perspective, um, as these products and services can be all contained within your AWS bill. So there isn't an, an external license or additional procurement channel. Uh, that you necessarily need to go through in order to get access and get started quickly with, with uh, products uh, such as those from FlashGrid. So um, that's just a quick summary of the of the partnership. Um, happy to hand it back to you, Art, to go deeper into higher availability. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bennett. Uh, I just want to say that our partnership with AWS has been uh, 
very important for us and uh, has been working very well. We appreciate it. And well, now let's get to the topic of um, um, maximizing Oracle database time on AWS. So what is the challenge? Um, well, first of all, uh, Oracle databases uh, power uh, most mission critical applications and services. And uh, uh, well, database down downtime often means that the entire service is down and this may be uh, unacceptable for uh, certain services, especially you know, that are processing uh, transactions. Um, and so many services, and that's what we hear from our customers, this must be up 24 by seven, uh, even no maintenance windows allowed. Uh, in, uh, even the stored database downtime may take down the entire application stack, uh, causing much longer service recovery time. So let's say a few minutes of down, uh, database downtime might result into much longer service downtime. But let's face the reality, uh, maintenance is required and failures do happen. So the question is, what do we do about this? What can we do about this? Well, let's uh, uh, discuss what are the main things that we I want to um, take care of when designing for maximum database uptime. Well, first of all, you probably need some sort of high availability architecture, but that's not enough by itself. Uh, you also need reliable and compatible components that are uh, part of that uh, highly available architecture. Because uh, you know, if the architecture by itself is great, but uh, your part Keep failing all the time. Eventually, uh, the your HA will not be able to handle it, and that's the reality. So, reliability of individual components is really important. Also, uh, the systems must be sized properly for the workload, because even even if the components are reliable and the architecture is well designed, you just throw ten times higher workload than it is designed for. Well it could end up um, either very slow or worst case could go down. It is also important to have all the systems and software components configured properly for the target workload and also for the HA architecture. Because again, the, uh, the HA architecture might be great, but if individual components are not configured well or properly for that particular architecture, you know, the architecture may not be able to help you in, in the case of a uh, failure. Uh, it is also important to control and limit the, um, the workload. Because even if your plan, you know, the, or your average workload is good and, you know, within the uh, size, uh, uh, within the limits that you uh, designed for, but there might be some accidental spikes or uh, uh, some misbehavior on the application tier side, that could potentially produce, uh, let's call it like self produce uh, denial of service attack. It could again, either make your database uh, perform very poorly or it could take it down completely. So it's really important to look after the, uh, the workload and make sure it does not exceed uh, certain limits. And then uh, uh, how do you know that your highly available architecture actually works? Uh, better to test and confirm that it actually does what it is expected to do in all various types of scenarios. And then you need to analyze uh, what is happening, how it is handling uh, various uh, failures or other uh, scenarios. Um, and uh, plan some improvements um, and adjustments. And this has to be done either by your internal engineering team, if um, you design the entire uh, AK architecture internally, uh, or uh, by a vendor like uh, FlashGrid or Amazon RDS, for example. And then planning for maintenance is also important because uh, again, maintenance is required. So it's either 
plan downtime that you have to take, or you uh, have to use an active-active architecture that allows you to avoid uh, maintenance downtime in most cases. Uh, there's, there are, of course, more things to take care of, such as disaster recovery, backup strategy, security. Those are beyond the scope of the today's talk, so we will not focus too much on those parts, uh, although they are definitely important for uh, uptime. So we'll be focusing more on HA and uh, reliability and maintenance. Well, let's look at what um, options you have today if you were to start building your Oracle database on AWS. Well, the simplest option uh, or simplest that is, uh, in terms of uh, what comes first to when uh, someone's mind is that, okay, I can install Oracle software stack on an EC2 instance um, and just run it. And yes, that will work. Um, the, Biggest question is what kind of um, uptime SLA you can actually expect there. So if we just go by the uptime SLA of an EC2 instance, then that's uh, 99.5%, which means uh, roughly 44 hours of uh, anticipated downtime per year. That may be good enough uh, for uh, some applications, especially not, uh, those that are not super critical. Uh, but a bigger question is, uh, can you actually uh, meet that uptime SLA? Because uh, there is much more than just an EC2 instance uh, doing its job and running uh, within those uptime um, SLA, uh, uh, within the requirements of the uptime SLA. The, the, the second option um, is uh, Amazon RDS for Oracle. Uh, the simpler single AZ option is kind of similar to your own, build your own um, you know, Oracle uh, standalone uh, or single instance database running on EC2. Uh, so there is uh, an uptime SLA by um, the RDS uh, service, which is again 99.5%. Uh, but here you actually trust uh, RDS uh, to uh, take care of all the configuration and uh, uh, compatibility, reliability uh, issues or questions that might come up. So here effectively, you don't have to do all or at least part of that work. You can trust RDS to do that. The uh, the second op, well, the other option from RDS is the uh, multi AZ deployment. Uh, this is an important distinction because um, uh, if you just use a single EC2 instance in a single availability zone, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, it all works fine until there is a bigger failure at the data center level. So if it's just a failure at the uh, Host level, there, there's uh, it can be rehosted quickly by AWS, uh, so that's usually not a huge problem. It might take some downtime, but uh, uh, it can be recovered relatively quickly. Uh, a bigger risk is a more rare situation where there is a failure that affects an entire data center, uh, maybe cooling problem, power problem, network problems, uh, which may result in, uh, in EC2 issues or EBS storage issues. So multi-AZ helps with that because uh, it allows you to fail over quickly to another data center. And that uh, helps us uh, with achieving much better uptime SLA. So now we are effectively protected against these data center failures that might potentially take hours to resolve. And by the way, data center failure does not mean that the entire data center is gone forever, like a major fire or something like that. No, it, it can be something much uh, more limited, but it still might take some hours to resolve. And it does happen. So multi-AZ is really important for any critical database. For any critical service, I would say, but database uh, for sure. 
The next option I want to mention is a flat rate cluster for Oracle failover HA. Uh, in many ways, it is similar to what RDS offers from HA perspective. Uh, there are some other differences, but from uh, HA perspective, it is uh, very similar. So we can say that the uptime and SLA targets are roughly the same. Next option is, uh, or next two options are actually a flat rate cluster for Oracle Rack. So these are uh, not only they allow you to use multi AZ, but they allow uh, these two options allow you to uh, use active active by availability where your database instances are running uh, simultaneously. So you don't have to take any downtime uh, when uh, there is a failure affecting your EC2 instance or an entire data center. So basically, the, there's no failover process as such. Uh, effectively, there may be some pause while the timeout can, um, but uh, it quickly continues after that. Uh, and uh, I mentioned here two options, although uh, uh, there are actually, and there's a longer list of options available, but uh, two nodes and three nodes are the, uh, the most basic options we offer. And yes, you can have more than three nodes. So basically with the two nodes, you can target uh, four nines of uptime SLA, which translates into uh, up to one hour of um, uh, downtime per year. And if you need uh, a better uptime SLA, then you can have three nodes spanning multiple availability zones or potentially even more nodes. So there we can actually uh, achieve uh, minutes of downtime per year, and, and that actually is uh, proven over the years so that we have been running uh, the solution on AWS. Uh, we can say confidently that these are realistic um, uptime tar SLA targets. I would like to... Um, talk a little bit more about multi-AZ versus single-AZ because this is such an important topic. So what are the advantages of multi-AZ? Well, I, as I mentioned, it allows you to survive failures that affect an entire data center, not just a single EC2 instance, but an entire data center. And that actually helps you to avoid the uh, need for disaster recover, uh, recovery failover uh, when uh, you, uh, when we have a sorter out, and sorter by sorter, I mean uh, something between, let's say, 10 minutes and uh, up to one day. Uh, because when an outage happens, sometimes the, you know, your system may be down already, or part of the system may be down, but you don't know the root cause yet. So AWS, well, it takes some time for AWS to figure out the um, what is causing the problem and what may be the um, the expected recovery time. So you don't really know. So you have to assume the worst. You have to engage the R or you have to be just stay uh, down if you don't use multi-AZ. And, and that, uh, that's painful uh, to say the least. And you know, if it happens in the middle of the night, so uh, you, well, a lot of people have to wake up and do start doing the, uh, working on a plan to address the situation. And it potentially may recover before you do the uh, DR failover, but you don't want to be in that kind of situation uh, where you're thinking, oh, should I switch my entire stack to the DR side, or should I wait for a little bit longer for things to improve? So if you have multi-AZ, you can avoid that uh, situation altogether. Uh, your systems keep running. They fail over or just keep running if it's active active within um, uh, multi AZ, so you don't have to uh, fail over to uh, disaster recovery site. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect is that uh, availability zones are usually close enough together, uh, like from from each other. So the latency between the availability zones is usually uh, quite low, like in most cases under one millisecond. It actually could be substantially lower than that. And that allows us to have synchronous data replication, which, is, which means also zero RPO, regardless of what sort of um, HA setup you have, 
uh, active passive or active active, yeah, you do get zero RPO if you set up synchronous data replication. And with multi BZ, that certainly makes a lot of sense to do that. Uh, there are some trade offs, however. Uh, the the latency is still higher than within a single AZ. So uh, if, depending on uh, the type of workload that might create some tax and performance, uh, but in our experience, that is usually not an issue. And uh, we actually uh, did a lot of work uh, measuring latency between availability zones, between all pairs of availability zones in all regions. You can actually look it up. Um, you can um, Google flash grid node space and find a, an article there about inter AZ latency. So you can actually see what those latencies are uh, in, in the region that you're interested in. There is definitely more planning needed to uh, for uh, the resource placement. So because uh, usually, if you use multi-AZ, uh, although the main resources can be spread across two availability zones, but you do need a third availability zone for your know, observer or uh, witness or a quorum node, whatever you call that, uh, that basically will provide some independent uh, opinion about which availability zone is healthy and which is not. Um, and and it also makes sense to deploy the entire application stack uh, as multi-AZ because uh, it will not help you much if uh, your database stack keeps running, um, but the rest of the stack uh, is down. So the entire uh, stack must be deployed as multi-AZ. Um, now, uh, we actually have seen that uh, uh, some of our customers and prospects that we talk to are somewhat confused about multi-AZ versus multi-region. Uh, while this is not a topic of our discussion, uh, really, but uh, we wanted to clarify the distinction that everybody's clear how availability zones are different from regions. So, uh, Bennett, uh, over to you if you could just um, give us a little bit more guidance here. Yeah, thanks, Hart. So today, AWS has 31 regions around the world, and this, this number uh, has been increasing, and we plan to continually invest in our data centers and our regions around the globe. And so within a region, there are multiple availability zones. And so today, there's a total of uh, 99 availability zones across our 31 regions. And of course, like we're talking about, there are trade-offs to decide whether your application is going to become multi-region or multi-AZ. When you consider things uh, around multiple regions, what you're doing is, is typically looking at the maximum amount of isolation and, and fault tolerance you want uh, for a workload. And these regions are typically separated by hundreds or thousands of miles. Therefore, there are considerations around uh, latency that have to be looked at. So sometimes an application or workload just simply uh, doesn't work effectively across multiple regions as it would say across multiple availability zones. There's other factors around deciding your regions and whether you go across multiple regions. And at AWS, we do have uh, some uh, considerations around which services available are in different regions and what features of those services are available, as well as pricing considerations. But for, today, for today's conversation, um, I mean, I think this chart here really shows kind of the trade-offs you have to look at when considering whether your workload is going to become multiple availability zones or across multiple regions. And um, like, like Art said, there, you know, there's multiple availability zones within a region that are separated up to 60 miles apart. And typically these data centers are, are um, you know, within 60 miles of each other so that you can get that really low latency. And while each, each availability zone is outfitted with uh, redundant power and, and networking to the facilities where they're, where they're located, uh, these, these, you know, can still, you know, have catastrophic events occur. And so designing for multiple available zones within a region certainly has a lot of benefits. I think it's a really key benefit here, but when you're looking at multiple regions, so you want multiple, uh, mo maximum fault isolation or the ability to do a disaster recovery to a completely separate region for your workload and your users. Uh, that's where different regions can come into play, and you can look at designing across um, regions in different continents or even within uh, a country. 
So um, just to kind of help paint the picture around the difference between regions and availability zones, again, we have 31 today regions, and within a region, there's multiple availability zones, and across all our regions, we have 99. All right, thanks, Bennett. I uh, just want to add that basically, again, for, for high availability architecture perspective, uh, we want to, um, we mean usually multi-Z deployments, not multi-region. Multi-region is important for your disaster recovery, for so you can set up data guard or um, golden gate replication for your Oracle databases, but that will be asynchronous. That's a different story that's um, uh, somewhat beyond of the scope of the today's discussion. So everything we talk about is around multi-AZ. Okay. All right, so what failure modes should we um, think about when we are planning um, uh, our highly available architecture? Well, usually what we notice is that uh, there are uh, some obvious failure modes that um, many people remember and that they plan for and that they test for. Uh, things like, well, what happens when you, your EC2 instance fails? Uh, and by fail, by the way, we mean effectively reboots or in the worst case, I mean, get stuck, it's, it's more rare. I usually does not disappear because uh, you still have redundant storage behind the disk, so you can easily get that instance back up and running, uh, unless it is uh, uh, a bigger failure that affects the entire data center. And the dead disks. Okay, so that can happen definitely, but I, I must say that it's a rare event. We, in our experience, <laughs> there's like very few cases where disks or EBS volumes actually die because EBS volumes are actually well protected. They, they are redundant storage. Um, and the, uh, what is more typical is that there, is, uh, there are some transient errors um, that might affect uh, operation of an EBS volumes at a given time, and that could cause some trouble, uh, but it's not like your EBS volume disappears. Again, it, it, is, it is possible that there may be some damage to the EBS volume, but it is much less likely than some transient error. And then database crap. Okay, that, that's happened. There are bugs in the software. Uh, everybody knows that. So yes, we have to plan for that. However, what we do observe in uh, many, many cases is that the types of failures that happen in reality are actually different, uh, or they happen more often than uh, the types of failures that everybody's worried about or is planning for. The number one big issue that we got exposed to when we started um, building these systems on AWS um, a few years ago back in 2017, uh, was that, well, there is uh, out of memory happens. And it can happen for various reasons. But what's worse is that it actually results in swapping. And actually, it doesn't even have to be complete out of memory. Even low memory can result in swapping. So, And the swapping is really bad. So I just, if, if you remember anything from this, the presentation, then uh, uh, disable swap. That's what we ask all our customers to do. And I realize this goes against Oracle's recommendations, but that's the reality. Um, those recommendations, in our opinion, are outdated. They are just historic. They are for historical reasons. Swapping is bad. It uh, creates some um, really dangerous situations. Um, then the, the other interesting uh, type of failure is uh, connection storms. So, and that goes back to you know controlling your workload, um, limiting your workload, because if you uh, throw too many connections at your database, it doesn't matter what kind of HA architecture you have, it, you may take it down. You may be able to take it down just by uh, having too many connections uh, and connections arriving too fast. And there are means to protect yourself against that. The other interesting uh, failure scenario is where 
EBS volumes may get stuck temporarily. So this is something that people don't realize, but you know, if there is a data center-wide failure and you know, EBS storage is affected, what happens again that your EBS volume does not disappear, your data does not disappear from the volume, but your IO stops. And you have to plan for that sort of event. The challenge here is that it actually happens very rarely. We'll talk about this um, uh, more in a minute. And then there are network disruptions. That can happen for various reasons, and you have to plan for that. Uh, and it, it, the sound here is that they can be very different, different patterns can be, uh, well, a clear disruption or it's a more complex um, pattern of disruption. And also um, various types of failures due to configuration errors. Well, there's human factor involved. You set up your HA system, you configure something incorrectly, and uh, well, it just doesn't do what you expect it to do. Um, you may just run out of certain resources because you did not configure it properly. So um, these are the things that definitely uh, make sense to keep in mind. And these are, of course, uh, this is not a full list of what can happen. These are the things that happen most often in our experience. Uh, and you know, our uh, we help our customers keep uh, their databases up and running for, for living. So, uh, and we are definitely, um, you know, when, when things like th these happen, we investigate them thoroughly, analyze, and uh, uh, I can say that these are the top issues that uh, we have seen. A maintenance. Well, maintenance is unavoidable because you do have to apply security patches for your databases, for your operating system. You do have to resize your uh, systems every once in a while, maybe not every month, but maybe once in a year or two. Uh, you might need to reconfigure something uh, after a long period of operation. And also there's a such a maintenance event like uh, EC2 host retirement. Like, well, the servers uh, get old, they uh, fail sometimes, and EC2 has a nice feature of actually taking uh, some of those uh, failures early and actually helping, uh, warning you that there will be a reboot plan for that. And what that means is that uh, that particular um, instance or that particular database instance might need to go down. So you have to plan for it. And so you have to decide what will be the impact of uh, on your application or service if you have to take down uh, the database instance. Uh, how much time can you allocate for the maintenance? How often you can do it? Uh, well, we have some customers who have to apply security patches for the operating system on a monthly basis. Well, and that's just mandated by their um, compliance uh, and security team. Uh, they have to do it. So you have to plan for it. Uh, how, and if you have to do something uh, urgently, uh, how soon can you schedule that maintenance? And who will need to approve that? So the process can be quite complicated. An alter a possible alternative is uh, zero downtime maintenance. And for that, you would need active active HA setup, with, uh, which actively requires uh, rack in most cases. Uh, and that allows you to have zero downtime rolling patching one database instance, uh, one EC2 instance at a time. Uh, so you can minimize or have zero impact on your application. So, and it actually makes your maintenance planning life much easier. The fault tolerance. Again, there are some, um, some types of errors or failures that are more obvious and also are easier to handle. Let's say your disk returns an error, an IO error. Okay, good, we have an error. Uh, there is a problem, well, hopefully there is a, a good error handling in place throughout the stack that can react to it. Uh, or your network becomes fully unavailable, it gets disconnected, I don't know, the cable got bad or 
um, uh, something else happened and your network get, gets disconnected. So it's pretty kind of standard type of situation. You uh, should be able to handle it uh, easily. Or your system rebooted. Again, nothing special, not, not difficult to drop it. Well, uh, what is more challenging is that is when um, there are some intermittent errors. And okay, if, it, if they are short term, maybe not a huge problem, but if they are repeating, um, they could create a situation where you have a double failure. So it's really important to isolate those errors uh, in a timely manner. If you have one failure, even if it's transient, it could potentially take down one of your resources, maybe a disk offline or your instance failed over um, or one of the instances is down. Uh, so you better have a way to, well, first isolate that particular case and just to do uh, whatever is needed to get to the full redundancy so that if, if it hits again, you're prepared. Um, but it's also important to re uh, remove that failure scenario so uh, you don't have to deal with it all the time. And um, what uh, any examples of uh, this type of uh, intermittent failures are, well, uh, this might be producing some uh, higher errors uh, that are non-fatal, but they are repeating. And that's not good, again, for the reason that actually could uh, produce, um, it just increases the chances of, uh, of a different type of failure hitting at the same time. Uh, network may get unstable, um, it, it go up and down uh, for, again, various reasons. Uh, much more rare situation, but it's uh, it, it, this one is a hard one to um, plan for, but it needs to be tested for. You need to test that, uh, yeah, your system can actually handle uh, this sort of um, network uh, problem. Or your uh, system has some uh, hardware problem potentially, and it just keeps rebooting, cracking. Okay, again, uh, a single crack or reboot could not be a problem, but if it, keep, if it keeps repeating, not good because it, uh, it might coincide in time with some other failure. And if you have two failures at the same time, well, there could be downtime. But what is even more dangerous is brownouts. And these must be prevented. And I mentioned swapping already. And swapping can happen as a result of out of memory or even just low memory. And when swapping happens, all bets are off. Even if you have a, a multi-node setup, well, your system can go down entirely because uh, when swapping happens, your system is neither alive nor dead. It will respond to some requests sometimes, but it might um, time out on other requests and it's just really hard to deal with it. So there is a really high risk of downtime for the entire uh, database service. A similar problem can happen if, you're, uh, if you have connection storms. Your CPU is basically saturated with too many processes uh, being active and uh, you know, some processes may not be able to get scheduled for a few minutes. And never, nobody knows who is uh, what is going to happen. Uh, also, if you're just running on some critical, re lo running low on critical resources, uh, that is also hard to predict what might happen, and it could happen simultaneously on uh, on all nodes. If uh, if you have a multi-node setup, or if you're even if you have a failover scenario, you switch to a even different uh, availability zone, but you consume that same resource again, and your system goes down again, and then it starts flipping back and forth and that's even worse. So brownouts are the most dangerous um, and more, very difficult to deal with. So they must be prevented. So every time this happens, it has to be thoroughly analyzed and just you need to do everything you can to prevent it from happening again. Uh, one more topic that I would like to highlight, this is just one of the failure types the disk I.O., but it's a really important one. Well, first, it's really important because we're, we are talking about databases. Uh, unlike some uh, applications or services that might be stateless, well, database is always stateful. It uh, 
well, its main function is uh, keeping your data on the disk, right? So disk IO is super critical for database functioning, but disk IO errors, failures happen. So um, it's really important to, uh, to make sure that your systems are designed to handle uh, those kind of uh, failures very well. Uh, so how are your disk timeouts configured? Um, it's a really important question to ask yourself or your engineering team. Uh, what happens if your disk IO is stuck for one minute, not for a second, not for two milliseconds, but for one minute? What if it gets stuck for one hour? Does anyone know what's going to happen? Have you tested it? Uh, okay, you've tested it today. A year from now, you're changing some instance type, you're upgraded your OS. Do you know that it's still, uh, the handling still works the same way? You cannot be sure unless you retest it. And that again, requires some commitment from engineering uh, resource um, from your engineering team or from a vendor like RDS or Flatgrid who will do this job for you. Uh, if you do yourself, or however, one tip I, uh, I'd like to mention is that uh, there is such a, there's a relatively new service that was introduced very recently. You know, we worked with the AWS team closely on this one. Um, it's called AWS Fault Injection Simulator for EBS. So what you can do is you actually can simulate that situation. You can introduce a, um, uh, an IO uh, pause for one minute or for one hour on one disk, on two disks, on all disks in your, on uh, one of the systems or all of the systems and see what happens. So that's the only way to be sure that your systems can handle this type of situation. And this situation will happen, well, quite likely will happen eventually, but these are rare events. So just because you've been running happily for six months doesn't mean that uh, it's not gonna hit you uh, tomorrow because, uh, well, uh, these kind of uh, failures happen when there is a bigger failure affecting maybe an entire data center. And they, those are rare. Okay, so, um, and this brings us to the next important question is, uh, how do you design your, how do you build your HA solution? You want to build your own HA? If you have a sufficient amount of engineering resources available, well, uh, that may be a good idea, uh, but you do need to have a commitment from your engineering to, um, for the significant and continuous investment of their resource. So you need to have a highly skilled database and cloud, cloud engineers, uh, not just design the system today, but also available 24 by seven during the entire life um, cycle of your system. And if it's not done right, you could expect some downtime happening uh, sooner or later. An alternative is the pre-integrated, highly available solution, uh, high availability solution, uh, such as RDS or um, a flat grid, uh, which allows you for uh, storage deployment uh, time, like, because you don't have to build it yourself, or you don't have to test it and engineer it. Uh, you get it pre-integrated, pre-built, uh, and it also helps you know, reduce the risk of configuration errors. So we, you know, we take that, um, job of uh, testing and keeping up with all the changes. And then 24 seven support, that's really important because these are a system and failures happen when you don't. So, uh, and this brings me to uh, the question of what Blackgrid has to offer um, uh, for, um, for your HA purposes. Uh, first uh, option that we are, I already mentioned, uh, Oracle um, Failover HA on AWS with Flutter Cluster. Uh, active passive HA setup, multi is what we recommend in most cases. Again, suitable for 99.95% uh, target uptime SLA. Uh, this is, uh, in terms of HA and uh, uptime SLA setup, it's similar to uh, RDS multi -AZ with an important difference that uh, there are certain things that we allow you to do that uh, you may not be able to do on RDS. And on the other hand, RDS is a fully managed service, so it's a lighter approach. Uh, uh, you need fewer engineering resources on, um, uh, on your end to implement it. But if you need full, full control of the uh, of your database feature, uh, features and uh, you need all of them, um, maybe you 
want to adhere to strict, uh, your own fully controlled um, platform and operate schedule, or you need really large um, instances or really large storage capacities about 64 terabytes. We have customers doing hundreds of terabytes. Um, uh, large throughput or bare metal instances. So this kind of solution provides you an alternative uh, that might be helpful with a similar up, um, uptime SLA. And it's uh, uh, brother, active active HA brother would be a uh, flat free cluster for Oracle Rack. Uh, nodes again, but now they are uh, active active. Both database instances are up and running. And um, now the target uptime SLA is 99.99%. Uh, and if you want to go even um, higher with your uptime SLA, you can have a three, uh, you can have three or more database nodes, and then uh, you can uh, increase your uptime SLA to uh, above four nines, potentially even up to five nines if you follow everything, all the best practices. Um, and support, uh, again, 24 by 7 support is really important. I'm not going to talk about RDS support. Uh, AWS the guys can um, tell you about that. But the uh, from flat rate support, what you get is the, uh, the 24 by 7 support for the entire uh, infrastructure stack. And that includes, obviously, the flat rate software components, but also uh, Oracle components and also the underlying uh, uh, AWS uh, components and Linux components as well. And we're really proud of the quality of support we're providing. Our customers give us awesome feedback, so we take it really seriously. Um, just an example of a recent project we had, uh, GMA. Um, it's a, um, a financial semi-government institution uh, in the United States. Uh, they actually were using RDS for most of their uh, database, uh, Oracle database needs, but some uh, databases, they uh, could not make them work on uh, RDS um, and uh, uh, they implemented uh, two node Oracle rack clusters for them uh, on AWS Gov Cloud. Uh, the migration was performed by uh, an AWS partner. There was a very good collaboration. Um, and uh, I must say that it was done very easily. From, well, um, there was actually there were actually no even support requests while they were doing the migration. So it worked, went very smoothly. And just some other customers uh, that uh, our uh, product uh, on AWS were receiving better uptime SLAs for their Oracle databases and uh, various industries, uh, government, financial payments, uh, e-commerce. So let me just summarize. Uh, we are actually quite over time already. Um, still a few minutes for questions, but let me just summarize uh, what we've talked about today. Well, first, uh, when you decide, you know, when you start deciding on the HA solution, well, first of all, you need to decide on your service uptime SLA, not database, but service uptime SLA. And your database uptime SLA must be higher than your service uptime SLA because um, otherwise, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it cannot be even the same, it has to be higher. Um, and then you have to choose the uh, HBA architecture that enables the targeted uh, uptime SLA plus DR and backup strategies. Um, then you decide whether you build your own uh, uh, solution or take one of the uh, pre-integrated HA implementations. Uh, again, ensure that the database and the applications here are sized and used correctly so you don't abuse your HA um, uh, setup. And then continuously monitor and make adjustments uh, as needed and when needed because that adjustments happen, you, uh, things happen, uh, changes happen. So you have this a continuous work to ensure that it all uh, runs uh, within your uptime SLA targets. And uh, now let's move on to the questions. We have still a few minutes left. Well, 
Thank you, Art. Um, so questions from the audience so far. Is Flash Grid for Oracle databases only? As of today, yes. Um, we focus on Oracle databases. This is where our expertise is. Uh, all the, you know, uh, since 2015, uh, we've been focusing on Oracle database. We might expand in the future, but this is all, all we do today. What is the largest database running on flash grid infrastructure today? Is there a size limit? Uh, there is no strict limit. Uh, it's basically um, uh, determined by the uh, by your requirements. Uh, the uh, I, I mentioned that we have customers who are into hundreds of terabytes of the uh, database size. Uh, you can use the uh, three or more database nodes, so pretty much any number of database nodes. Um, and uh, fortunately, there are uh, EC2 instances now available that provide up to 200 gigabits per second of network bandwidth. So that's plenty uh, low latency network interconnect. Um, so there's quite a lot of uh, potential for uh, performance scaling. Um, so we don't have a strict limit, uh, but yes, the, um, the underlying infrastructure will have to be selected carefully if your performance needs are really high. And we can help with that, and we can actually help with the uh, sizing and uh, performance assessments. Um, Is Flash Grid a managed services provider? Do you host databases for customers? Uh, no. Uh, we are a software vendor, and uh, I want to be very clear about this. Uh, we don't host your data. No, we provide um, the Flatbread cluster product as a pre-integrated appliance. It's an open appliance. You still can fully control it, but it runs in your AWS account. So we, Flatbread, don't have access to it. Um, and that's the distinction between Flatbread and, AWS and Amazon RDS service. So it is not hosted and it's not managed. Uh, a lot of our customers have uh, internal um, database and cloud teams to manage uh, their clusters. Uh, a lot of uh, other customers use the uh, third-party managed service providers who do day-to-day -day maintenance. And we provide support to them directly or through the MS their MSP of choice. Um, but again, uh, this is not a hosted solution. And that actually helps with a lot of security and private data privacy uh, questions. Is flash grid only for cluster databases? Is it possible to improve availability of a single instance Oracle database? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we haven't been advertising it too widely yet, but uh, you can find uh, uh, single instance uh, based solutions as well uh, on our website. And uh, yes, actually we can help you with single instance. So if you're interested, uh, definitely talk to us. Uh, uh, we can, uh, you can deploy single instance databases with flash grid. And by the way, the deployment is as easy as, uh, well, both for clusters and single instance. So it's fully automated cloud formation or Terraform based, um, and, uh, infra um, infrastructure as code approach. Um, and, uh, in the end you have, uh, even with single instance, uh, we can help you with uh, our tools, with a pre-configured uh, um, infrastructure uh, and 24-7 support. So which does help with doing better uptime SLAs. Although this hasn't been a focus of today's discussion, but yes, we can do that. What scaling options are available for databases running on flash grid? Can a cluster be scaled vertically and horizontally? Is auto scale available? Uh, auto scale, no. Uh, want to be very clear about that. Uh, vertical scaling is what we recommend um, in majority of the deployments uh, for our customers. Uh, the most standard configurations that we offer are either two uh, nodes or three nodes. And within that, those configurations, you can scale up and down. You can resize the, the, uh, the EC2 instances. You can start with as small as four physical cores, and you can go up to the largest 400, um, 224 
hours or 448 vCPUs. Uh, so there's a lot of um, vertical scaling potential. Um, and uh, uh, and for horizontal, um, need to be more careful about that. So we usually uh, have a discussion with our um, uh, customers about their horizontal scale needs, but the short answer is yes, uh, horizontal scaling is also possible. Like I said, you can have any number of uh, database nodes and also additional, uh, any number of storage nodes, so you can scale your CPU memory uh, and uh, storage throughput horizontal. And the final question is, where is Flashcode based and what geographies or AWS regions do you serve? Uh, our headquarters are in uh, California. Um, uh, however, we work with customers around the globe. Uh, literally, we have customers in, in all continents, I believe. Uh, and uh, we have our well, we have 24 by 7 support coverage. So we have a distributed uh, support team. So um, and um, uh, the software is available through AWS Marketplace on all AWS in all AWS regions. So, if you have a access to AWS in your geography, we can work with you. Thank you. I believe this is it, no more questions. All right, perfect. We're just one minute over time. Uh, thank you, everybody who stayed with us uh, throughout this webinar. And uh, if you have any questions uh, that um, uh, you haven't asked, uh, uh, please uh, just get in touch with us. Uh, here is the email um, address, and uh, we'll be happy to answer. We respond very quickly, so uh, do not hesitate. Use this email for asking your questions. Thanks again, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.